one defining moment. The universe emerged out of nothingness like a bright idea. And so has each one of us. Born into this world unique and gifted. A masterpiece cast like never before and never after. A magnificent work of art. And each one of us an artist too. Eager to paint the canvas of life. Remember as a child, you woke up each morning full of wonderful ideas and dreams. Dreams where everything was possible. You wanted to change the world and you believed that you could. Believed in superheroes and believed you could be one. And then it all slowly slipped away. But that does not mean that superheroes do not exist. These heroes stepped out of nothingness into greatness. They were ordinary folks who wanted to make a difference, who believed in their dreams. They were just like you and me, except where everyone else saw the rubble, they saw a palace standing. And when everyone else was enveloped with the darkness of self-doubt, they saw light within. I am Simarjeet Singh, and I believe that the same light flickers in you and in me. I also believe that you have everything you need to reach the pinnacle of your success. And I'm here to tell you that the only person standing between you and your success, between you and your dreams, is you. And it can all change in the moment the voice inside you says, Yes, I can. Yes, I can live with passion and purpose. Yes, I can lead. Yes, I can make a difference. I am the artist and the world is my canvas. I am the superhero I once believed in as a child. And that defining moment is now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another series of the Beginner's Minds um, interviews and virtual conversations with some very wonderful people across the globe. I clearly remember the year was 2007. My wife and I were attending the NLP Practitioners Program in London with a wonderful gentleman uh, called Mr. Bruce Farrell from a company called Hellfort 2000. Now, we would already been sent the audio training material uh, in the mail and the books and everything, so we did all that beforehand. But during this seven day long NLP practitioner program, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of hands-on activities with the cohort, with the group, and we would do public speaking and so many other things. On one particular day, um, we had to do storytelling. And um, something happened after the storytelling session that was going to significantly change my life. Now, here's how the NLP storytelling format went. You know, you'd open a story and then you would not finish it. Then you'd start another story and you would not finish it. And then you'd start a third story and you will not finish it. Then you'd insert your main message in between because that's when the listener's mind was most open. And then you would close your third story and then you would close your second story and then finally close your first story so you had the complete attention of the listeners during this entire time. Wonderful activity. We had to come up with our own inspirational stories. And the cohort, uh, the group used to get together for drinks every evening. And uh, one, of, one of the gentlemen, one of, one of the participants, this tall gentleman, he came up to me to, in the evening and he said something that was going to um, change the direction of my career. He said, uh, I know it was just a practice session in there. We were just practicing with our own stories. Perhaps this was the first time for many of us. But you were very good at that entire storytelling thing, you know, the voice modulation, the content and everything. And um, he said, I felt really inspired, Simarjeet, which was the beginning of my love affair with oratory, with public speaking, with realizing the impact and the power of words, how the right words said in the right way at the right time to the right person can change the direction of their life. In one of our previous episodes, uh, our wonderful guest from Singapore, uh, Mark Stewart, his parting words for the audience was, were, find your voice. And ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to tell you that our guest today will not only help you find your voice, but also make a point. Because that's the name of her company. Our guest today is Maz Ifsel, 
the gorgeous and talented Maz Ifsa. First of all, let's, let's welcome her with a round of virtual applause. <laughs> Maz, thank you for taking out the time to be here with us today. Thank you for having me, Simajit. Absolute pleasure, Maz. All the way from the UK, we really appreciate that. Maz is a passionate and committed public speaking and communication skills expert, and this is going to be nothing less than a masterclass, guys. So please make sure you have your pen and paper handy to take note, loads of notes for all the important things that are going to be shared during this conversation. Having acquired her experience working for some of the highest profile financial institutions such as Barclays and Goldman Sachs, etc., she has intelligently transitioned her skill set to become an industry leading expert in her field. She has developed a profound understanding of the different aspects needed to deliver powerful, persuasive presentations. She works with CEOs, politicians, creatives, bankers, scientists, educators, executives, and graduates. And she's very passionate about her work, as I'm sure you will witness during the course of this conversation. And also, she's passionate about the power of great oratory and great presentations, how they can change opinion and minds and history. Um, and her key quality is her mindset strength, coupled that with her deep understanding of emotional intelligence of how people think and work. She's a real force to be reckoned with. Maz, once again, you are welcome to the Beginner's Minds Show. Thank you, Simcha. I want to start off with uh, your work at Make a Point. I love the name, by the way, very creative. All of us in this extra noise that social media has allowed us to create. <laughs> now we see LinkedIn Live happening and Facebook Live happening and YouTube. Now suddenly we all can broadcast, we all can publish and create content and we have the entire world for our audience, right? So with yeah. all this extra noise, it's all the more important to make a point. Tell us more about your work at Make, make a Point and what you do uh, in your current role. Well, due to the pandemic, we've actually moved to the virtual world and I run a communication boot camp virtually. It's a three hour boot camp run in a one to one or a group of five. And Simajit, it extends far beyond informing and engaging. It's about standing out, like you said, in a world that's right now filled with so much noise. You know, mm -hmm. one of the most common challenges that we help people overcome is the fear of public speaking. You know, many clients tell us that they're absolutely fine speaking on a one-to-one -one basis, but put them in front of a group of people and actually everything changes. Mm -hmm. You know, whether our clients have the fear of speaking or find the experience uncomfortable, we help them. You know, the boot camp gives you the tools to manage your nerves and anxiety, speaking with confidence and clarity knowing how to craft and deliver a presentation with ease. You know, we use very effective and powerful techniques that help the most nervous speakers conquer their fear. And also you'll discover how to get your message across and influence others with presentations that make people want to listen. Mm -hmm. The boot camp will help you connect with any audience and make them care about your message and get your point across without rambling and actually master the art of sounding natural and conversational while actually secretly being well prepared. Mm -hmm. Think and speak on your feet. The communication boot camp is actually meticulously crafted to help our clients connect and engage with their listeners, not just intellectually, mm -hmm. but also emotionally, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and in a nutshell, that's what the boot camp is, Simajir. Uh, that's fantastic. And I do agree with the point about preparation, because that's one of the secrets uh, there is, yeah. is to, um, I had somebody ask me the other day, oh, you know, I love this sort of, um, it's like you play tennis with your guests, you know, it's like you already know what they're going to talk about. And then are you not listening to them while they're speaking, because you have something valuable to add to it. And my answer simply was, um, you know, uh, wonderful things happen to the prepared mind, you know, and I completely agree with you, Maz, on the preparation part. Um, I'm curious now, uh, this is a niche in terms of um, self, the whole vast ocean of self-improvement industry, helping people improve their presentations and public speaking and the fear around it. How did you get into the space? What prompted the change from finance, where obviously you were doing very well with some of the leading names in the industry? What uh, prompted the transition into what you doing right now was it boredom just like in my case or what was it was it something you felt there's something great something emerging inside me and i want to give expression to that new thing um well i used to be a stockbroker oh. so you know strong communication skills were vital to the success in the field of stockbroking 
Why? Because you need to sell your services and manage relationships. You know, you need to stay updated on the latest financial news to understand the movement in the market and the drivers of change. And then this information needs to be communicated to the client and the ability to translate technical data into usable information for those who may be very unfamiliar with the financial jargon is actually mm. a key skill for finance professionals. Do you know Again, the image that's that? Do you know the image that's moving in my mind right now? <laughs> it's Leonardo DiCaprio, Wolf of Wall Street, <laughs> a motivational speech. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. my killers. Go pick up the phone. The phone is not going to <laughs> dial itself. You dial the phone and sell it. And the, I love that movie. Well, bits and pieces of it. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that the movie is glamorous. This this is not glamorous. Trust yeah. Me. <laughs> and I saw many employees, Simajit come and go, many with actually great credentials, mm -hmm. you know, degrees from Oxford and, and Cambridge, um, but they were not able to express or articulate, you know, and not win the client. And as corporate communication became more and more integral to success, mm -hmm. companies started hiring these so-called public speaking coaches. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, is speaking that we actually need something to train on? Isn't it something that just comes naturally when we're mm -hmm. born? Mm. Now, the question here is, did I choose public speaking as a career or did it choose me? Mm. Um, and I think it chose me. You know, it comes to me naturally. I'm the founder of Make a Point, mm -hmm. a company that was born through a healthy blend of passion, frustration and a curiosity ignited by a genuine desire to make a difference. The difference wow. revolves around connecting, not just simply presenting. Right. Making a difference is mm -hmm. what drives a day synergy. A difference, mm -hmm. how organizations inspire, how mm -hmm. they influence, and how they engage people through the way they present their ideas. A difference to the way presentation skills are taught and a difference to the way in which professionals think about and develop their public speaking skills. And I have a philosophy that I follow in a nutshell that connecting is everything. Right, right. Especially in a virtual world, especially in a virtual world uh, where now we've been holed up inside of our homes for so long yeah. and yeah. keynote speakers like myself have become used to wearing a suit and flip-flops. Um, so we, <laughs> we're going to have a rather difficult time getting, <laughs> getting, getting used to le wearing leather shoes once again and so many other challenges. But at the same time, yeah. when we return back to normal, I don't know, there's going to be some amount of uh, hesitation around what, what do I do? Do I uh, do the traditional handshake or do I give the hug as I used to? I mean, you know, so that we will go through that and it's all the more important. And I love what you said about connection is the bottom line. It's not a lot of people I know begin to sell or try to influence even they've invested in making a connection and that's a recipe for disaster because you have not shown the other person that I care about you that I care about where you come from what are you trying to do you have not made that connect and uh, it's often said that uh, I think Tony Robbins he said this uh, human beings uh, don't make a vast majority of their decisions uh, using logic we use the majority of our decision making is driven by emotions and by and large, no matter how well educated we might be or whatever models we might have learned in B school, but some of the biggest decisions in our lives did, were not made using those models. They were driven by gut feeling and instinct and that's all uh, I believe that connection that you're talking about is. And as machines progress, as, as we have more bots to answer our Twitter uh, queries and so many other things, as we have artificial intelligence and machine learning, I believe we humans should get better at what we do best. And what we do best is influencing and leading and um, communicating and empathizing and those sort of things. And we need people like yourself, Maz, who, who specialize in this uh, thing. And thank you for, once again, for sharing this wealth of wisdom with us. My next question with, with something that, that you're doing uh, in your current line of work, did it um, come to you as, as, were you a natural always at public speaking? Were you born uh, extrovert back in school or back in your education? Were you always like the people person in the class or did you acquire this? Because I'll tell you why I'm asking. A lot of people have this mindset uh, barrier that only extroverts can influence, only extroverts can lead, and only extroverts can express. Introverts should just keep their thoughts to themselves and do the work they're good at, and hence they miss out on so many wonderful opportunities. Um, so there's two sides to this question. One is about you. Were you always 
an extrovert or good good at being a people person. The second is uh, about this mindset barrier that introverts have. Okay, it's interesting. I mean, I myself, I'm a natural ex ex extrovert and I'm definitely a people's person. It comes to me naturally. Mm -hmm. However, interesting, Simajit, that you say introverts feel that, that they cannot be good public speakers. I mean, to bring to your attention, you, obviously you probably already know this, many world-renowned speakers are mm -hmm. introverts, mm -hmm. you know. Um, in fact, being an introvert, Simajit, can actually be a good asset to become a great public speaker. Mm -hmm. You know, introverts are people who tend to look inside themselves. Yep. They actually pay more attention to their own thoughts and feelings, not because they're not able to give attention to people or things mm -hmm. that happen around them. Mm -hmm. They do because they're most stimulated by the inner world you know take the example of barack obama who was the president mm. of the united states of america who would have mm. thought he's actually very much of an introvert mm. you know then we have bill gates the founder and chairman of microsoft although he's introverted actually he's not a shy person mm. but there are also introverts and shy public speakers one of them being um her name was Eleanor Roosevelt, she was the mm -hmm. most influential first lady in the U.S. history. You know, right. An official biography wrote that she was shy. She was very awkward. However, she managed to show herself as very public and a very entertaining persona. And mm -hmm. during her duty as first lady, she even became um, a U.S. spokesperson at the United Nations after her husband had died. So she had a thought, voice of her own. Yeah, she had a voice of her own. So mm -hmm. a thought to leave our listeners with is why are these introverts able to be great speakers, Simajit? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I read this wonderful book by Susan Cain sometime back. I'm sure well, it's the cover is white, so I'm not sure if you can see it. It's called Quiet, uh, the power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. And uh, I love what you said about so many influential, successful people. Uh, who were technically introverts or ambiverts and uh, preferred their little cave to retreat back to, to rejuvenate, to get their ideas. Uh, my personal take on, and I completely agree with what you said, my personal take on this whole introvert, you know, fear factor is that it's a mindset block. And one, yeah. once you're pulled forward by a purpose, you know, I consider myself an ambivert. I prefer to retreat to my shell every now and then. To sort of read up and no introvert. I well, can't um, believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so so here's ambivert. Now I, I can change according to situations. So I'm doing a large key, a presentation to a large uh, audience of a thousand somewhere in you know in the country or internationally. I'd love to mingle with them after the presentation is over because I'm in that frame of mind. And what's driving me is um, the the power of what I want to convey to this audience. You know, this opportunity yeah. here, there's a thousand people gathered under the same roof. And if they can clearly, distinctly understand what I want to communicate, I make, might make a little bit of a difference in how these people think and act. And that's a great opportunity, right? You, in large companies, you don't have a thousand people sitting under the same roof and you don't have their undivided attention every day. That happens once a year, you know, annual conferences and things like that. So that opportunity drives me forward so much. And then afterwards, I'd like to retreat back into my little world, you know, okay, what can I do better next time? What's out there what do i need to learn what do i need to improve i need that time to recharge myself so otherwise if i'm constantly moving from one speaking engagement to the next i feel exhausted at times saying okay probably running short of ideas and if i feel i'm getting bored perhaps using the same examples or stories and things maybe my audiences as well i need to rediscover so that's why i say okay the phone goes into the airplane mode no more you know social interactions cut it down rejuvenate recharge and then come back so that's sort of the dexterity that ability to move from one to another is is there but yeah. by and large in, in school and college mass yes i would prefer to keep to myself or have a limited uh, group of people that i'd uh, i'd love to interact with however one huge thing uh, one thing that plays a huge role was travel I remember I was a young uh, 19 year old when I first went for my higher education to Sydney, Australia. The, the year was 1999 and um, wow. here I am in an entirely different culture than my own. And I think those experiences and then my next, my first job happened to be in the United States with uh, Marriott International in Scottsdale, Arizona. Then I spent four years in the UK. 
And then all those experiences working in different cultures. And Dubai, Dubai was one of these places where I, I was leading a team of 180 something in in the food and beverage department. And we had more than 50 nationalities. So I had Pakistani, Sri Lankan, Bangladeshi, South African, British, Irish, right? People from all over and with many of them with no previous experience in the industry. And you had to bring all of these people together to come to the same set of standards. Those experiences I feel helped me develop this ability to, you know, even if my subconscious is telling me, no, 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 you should wait until he or she takes the initiative to say hello. But now I changed it being in this industry, the hospitality industry changed it also. So I'd say, hey, my name yeah. is Simerji, then what's yours? And I'd initiate. And that takes courage. You know, that takes yeah. courage because um, your mind is telling you, shut up. What if he, uh, the other person doesn't respond back, right? <laughs> Which could yeah. always be a tricky situation. Uh, Maz, you've done obviously a lot of research around, you know, some of the most influential speakers, presenters in the history of the world. Um, tell us, are there... What are the common traits that these people have um, that perhaps uh, we or our listeners could also follow in order to become more effective public speakers? Um, I think effective speakers, or as I call, persuasive speakers or persuasive speeches, they're mm. actually designed to convince the audience of, you know, a speaker's point of view. You know, if you're writing one, every element from your opening statement to the main body and conclusion must reinforce that goal. Good persuasive speeches, good effective speakers share several common characteristics. You know, those qualities include an opening statement that actually grabs interest, right. evidence that establishes your credibility and a conclusion that compels the listener to support your position or take action. Also, I'd like to add smart pacing and this means good speakers recognize the value of actually a balanced presentation. Many of the most remembered historical speeches are the shortest. Right. Um, I could think of the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. That's only 300 words, mm -hmm. you know. Time your speech while you're practicing it so you can cut repeating or unnecessary phrases. Also, make sure that you spend roughly the same amount on each main point. And this approach right. gives your speech a, a steady, measured pace that's important in maintaining credibility with an audience, Imajit. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I love what you said about keeping it short. And yeah. some of us uh, struggle with that at times, especially when we are a little excited which we happen to be when we are on a stage or making a virtual presentation. Um, perhaps that filter is not activated at that point of time, which tells us, you know, how do I keep it concise and to the point? Um, but before, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into brevity. Uh, how do we, as public speakers, influencers, or someone who's learning the art of influencing, how, what are your tips on keeping it short? I think, again, you know, with any speaking engagement is, if it helps to write it down mm -hmm. um, and then take notes from that. You know, sometimes when we're writing, we add so many things and we think actually that's not needed and this isn't yeah. needed. You've right. got 30 minutes to do a speech, then mm -hmm. spend 15, 20 minutes, you need 10 minutes for the Q&A. You know, it's really, really important. Often, mm -hmm. why is it that the listener gets bored? It's because the speakers stared off the subject. Right. And it's it so important that you don't do that. You know, right. people think that sometimes we have to have the speech so long, but actually you don't. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. the shortest speeches that are so powerful, Simajit. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with when I had to uh, do my first um, TEDx presentation. I struggled with that a little bit in the sense that um, the, the TEDx uh, speeches, they have a time limit. I'm not used to time limits and that to 16, yeah. 18 minutes sharp and um, so, yes, what you suggested was definitely what I followed uh, back then as well, was to write it down and then I would read it out, you know, read it out in my head and I'll probably visualize the speech. I say, okay, perhaps this is unnecessary or perhaps in the process of doing that, I'll, I would come up with another idea. Perhaps this can add a bit of humor here or this could be a little personal anecdote here and this could create a better connection so that that mental revision sort of uh, really helped. Uh, one another resource uh, I've been using lately is Twitter. Um, if you, okay. with the character restriction there, if you can communicate something in the character limit for Twitter and perhaps 
there's so many other people who are doing conveying effective messages out there. But so many people that I follow, I'm pretty much a silent observer at the moment. I don't post a lot, but I do follow a lot of other wonderful writers who would, you know, you would say, wow, this, this guy was able to say so much in so uh, in a very few uh, amount of words. And, you know, that sort of, uh, I want to imbibe that into public speaking as well. So thank you for your tips on that. And um, Maz, in, in terms, your work centers around helping people overcome mindset barriers when it comes to public speaking and influencing. And um, and I know, uh, I don't know if there was actually a survey, but I usually I hear about it, uh, that there was a survey somewhere on planet Earth, which asked people about their top fears. And yeah. um, on the, the top of this list was the, uh, the fear of public speaking, which in many cases was ahead of the fear of death. Uh, so some people would rather be dead than go on stage and make themselves vulnerable and present their point of view to the world or make a point to the world. Um, I want to know about where does this fear, or why is it so hardwired into us, this fear of public speaking, this fear of standing out and expressing yourself and what can one do to overcome it um i think as you've rightly said there's been a great deal of research into the causes of the fear of public speaking but none of the research has been particularly conclusive you know mm -hmm. some psychologists trace extreme cases of stage fright to childhood trauma others say that the fear of speaking builds gradually over time as we avoid every opportunity to speak um, others point out that the fear of public speaking may be a product of low self-esteem and a fear of being judged harshly. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that all are true to some extent, Simajit. Right. But I think that most of us fear public speaking for the same reason that many people fear swimming, flying, skydiving. Just as we weren't designed to jump out of aer aeroplanes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we weren't designed to stand up and give speeches. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that, that deserves a round of applause. I think that's so well said. Yeah, it does. Indeed. We weren't designed to jump out, jump out of airplanes. I tried that when I was in Vegas in 2018. And I tell you what, it took me next two days to get my heartbeat rate under control. So uh, I, I can relate with that. Yes. So right. we have to adapt strategies to overcome these design shortcomings and our fears. Mm -hmm. Because what is fear? And I teach this in my coaching. Fear is false evidence that actually appears real. I mean, wow. that's all, you know, mm -hmm. that's what fear is. I mean, you speak about um, mindset blocks, you know, regarding public speaking. Mm -hmm. um, again, can I go through some that I come across in my coaching? Yes, please. So one of them is I get this a lot when I ask my client to, you know, for the presentation and they say, well, in their mind, I will embarrass myself. And this is a really common fear scenario where the client dreads being in front of an audience for the fear of saying something embarrassing. And then this creates a tremendous anxiety as it's commonly linked to a worst case scenario of extreme embarrassment. And when I ask, where's this thought coming from? Mm -hmm. Most of my clients recall a situation from their school years when they spoke in class and they were laughed at. You know, right. these school years, as you know, challenging, as you know, are very mm -hmm. challenging for all of us and have a significant impact on our beliefs and self-esteem. But, and I say but, only if we allow it. Um, another mindset block that I get is, I will actually blank out and I'm going to forget what to say. Mm -hmm. You know, standing in front of an audience and completely forgetting what to say is a situation that makes you nervous even before you're nervous. It does, you know? yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is what causes many people to completely script their presentations and they spend hours trying to memorize it. However, the hours spent usually lead to a stressed out and tired presenter mm -hmm. as you're so nervous that you just want to grind through the presentation and get it over with. And run away, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and run away. And is this going to lead to a great presentation? Highly unlikely. Agreed. Um, yeah. So the, you know, the tools used is I always ask my clients to challenge your beliefs, to reduce that fear, the fear of embarrassing yourself and linking it to a school age situation must mm -hmm. also be challenged. Compare who you are now right. to the person you were back then. Were you an inexperienced speaker, unsure of your identity, 
Chances mm -hmm. are, Amaji, yes to both. These years, they're vital for our development and contribute to who we are today. You know, wow. we've changed and achieved a lot since then, you know. So don't hold yourself back from success today because of a learning experience that you had many years ago. I'm reminded of a quote by Carl Jung here who said, uh, I'm not what has happened to me. I am who I choose to become. And I think yeah, that, I that. Uh, yeah, I it that. resonates with what you're saying. I'm not what has happened to me. And we all, we all have our stories. We could have been bullied at school. We could have been picked on, you know, by, by other family members or whatever, or somehow we developed that inferiority complex. And, uh, but then remember, as you rightly said, all these years in between, you've grown so much, you've added on new skills, you've, your, your horizon has expanded and broadened than before. You are not who you were or what has happened to you. You are who you choose to become and you can make that choice starting right at this moment. Thank you. That's, that's really important. Um, you, you talked about, you know, practice and rehearsal and writing. I, I want to know your views on what's the right, uh, is, is there a right mix between spontaneity and scripting your speech or your presentation? Um, how far should I go into, to what amount of detail should I go into when it comes to preparation? How much room for spontaneity should I leave so that it appears natural? And um, yeah. I think each to their own. It's whatever works for you. There's not one set of rules for all. Some are very great off the cuff, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't need any notes. Some people actually need, me myself, I need notes to prompt me so I don't forget my trail of thought. Right. Some people, even on stage, hold cue cards. Mm -hmm. But I've as seen that, the yeah. more, yeah, yeah, the more you do it, Simajit, the more you become comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. And also, when you're knowledgeable in your subject, it actually yeah. comes to you naturally. Right, right. So practice. Right. That, that's the key. Yeah. How many times have you done it? And also how long you've been doing it as well as your yeah. subject matter expertise. So let's say yeah. you're, you're a presenter on, not everyone is an inspirational speaker. Let's say you're a presenter on youth issues or child abuse or, you know, finance or space research or whatever it happens to be. The, what, what you're saying uh, in effect is that the more command you have on your subject matter, your chances of being um, speaking without preparation, you could do it better off than as compared to other situations. Now, that's very important. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in making yourselves vulnerable on a public stage and, you know, sharing your message is uh, the imposter syndrome. And I, I feel the, regardless of the experience that you might have, regardless of the credibility, the educational qualifications, et cetera, the more you, the higher you climb the ladder, it's obvious you're going to encounter situations that you were not in before, right? So you would, the, if, you climb, if you're climbing the ladder up higher, you're going to be in new situations uh, and those new situations are going to make you feel uncomfortable and you perhaps at some stage, you are going to experience the imposter syndrome. Do I have mm -hmm. a right to be here? Why should I yeah. be listened to? Am I wasting their time? And all these negative limiting questions um, actually reduce your confidence and the impact of your final presentation. And this is a huge issue, Maz. I'm sure you must have encountered this. Yeah. Talk to us, please, about the imposter syndrome, the root causes, and how do we overcome it? So to counter these feelings, you know, nine out of 10, you end up working very hard and you hold yourself to an even higher standard, correct? Mm -hmm. And that pressure, Simajit, can eventually take a toll on your emotional well-being and not just right. your emotional well-being, but mm -hmm. actually your overall performance. So tips to keep it under control is firstly, challenge your doubts. When imposter syndrome, when those feelings surface, uh -huh. ask yourself, whether any actual facts support these beliefs, mm. okay? Agreed. Then look for pieces of evidence to counter them. Also, very important is to acknowledge your feelings, identifying the imposter feeling and bringing them out into the light of day can accomplish several goals. You mm -hmm. know, what do I mean? Talk to a trusted friend or mentor about right. your distress. And that mm -hmm. can you get some outside context on the situation sure sharing the imposter feeling can help you feel less overwhelming opening up to your peers about mm -hmm. how you feel encourages them to do the same helping you realize you aren't the only one who feels like an imposter yeah the bottom line mm -hmm. success doesn't require 
perfection. True perfection, wow. yeah, is practically impossible. But failing to achieve, it doesn't make you a fraud, Simajit. Offering mm -hmm. yourself kindness, compassion, instead of judgment and self-doubt can help you yeah. maintain a realistic perspective and actually motivate you to pursue healthy self-growth. Do you agree? I definitely do. And I like the part about, <clears throat> you know, not chasing perfection, which I believe is a disease. And sometimes it's great to raise the bar. It's, it's good to improve your body language, your content, your, you know, to keep constantly upgrading yourself. But at the same time, I agree with what you said is not to be so harsh on yourself that it takes a toll on your uh, entire well-being and that's going to be visible in your final presentation. Your audience will yeah. be able to feel it. Uh, and I love what Marissa Peer said. I had the opportunity of speaking to Marissa Peer sometime back and she said, uh, uh, I am enough was the number one affirmation. I am enough. And I love that. Uh, and, and this is not something to hide behind. It's not something to say, well, I haven't worked hard. I haven't, I'm, I, I think I'm going to try and wing it and I haven't prepared for it. And but at the same time, I'm going to use this affirmation, I am enough, and I'm just going to go on stage. And that's the other extreme of it. What I'd like to do is I'd like to put in the number of hours I feel in terms of designing the message, doing the hard work, doing the research, doing my visualization, doing everything I need to do. And then before I go on stage to remind myself, I am enough, you know, I am enough. And yeah. this presentation here is going to add value to people's time. And I'm not going, I'm, I'm not wasting my time. And sometimes what I feel, uh, what I feel is that at a subconscious level, if this, if we allow this imposter syndrome to kick in while you're presenting, people just rush through it because uh, back of your mind, your subconscious is telling you, oh, you don't deserve to be here. You're, you're yes. wasting the time of 300 people. You rather, you fit, nobody's paying attention. An interesting example comes to my mind as uh, sometime back, I presented to a large multinational in India. And I had, it was so, the, the team members had traveled from different parts of the world. And it was around team building and leadership and et cetera. I had a few activities as well. I could see the vast majority of the audience engaged with what I was talking about except one lady who was busy with her laptop throughout the course of the first 20, 25 minutes. And I, I probably glanced at it and looked away. And in my mind, I was thinking, how rude is that? You know, I mean, everybody else is, if I, if I ask them to raise their hands, they're participating, everything. What could be so important, right? That cannot wait. And so anyway, but I ignored that. And after 45 minutes, when I was <clears throat> doing an activity which involved me moving around the room, I just happened to glance at that laptop and I was so ashamed for myself because there on that screen were detailed notes of everything I'd said after saying good morning, detailed notes of everything. She was typing in frantically. She wanted to catch, she was trying to keep pace with me. And there I was doubting her intention about not paying attention to me while she was fully engrossed. So sometimes we blow things out of proportion. And as, as you rightly said, you need that inner work. You need that powerful conversations inside to overcome that. Um, the, um, the next question I'd like to dive in is um, this structure. Um, do you feel a good keynote or a good speech or a persuasive speech? And you've studied many. One of my personal favorites is uh, Barack Obama's. There are no red states. There are no blue states. His speech at the, demo at the convention, uh, which, which probably a lot of people say that that is the one that put him in the limelight on the national stage of American politics. Uh, that's, that's one of the speeches that I love. Um, but is, is, there a, is there a secret formula or structure to an effective persuasive presentation or speech as? Okay. Um, again, I get a lot of clients ask me that. Mm -hmm. Nice talent. What's the secret formula? What's the secret? Yeah, we want to know. <laughs> yeah, what's the secret? What's the secret? Yeah. And yeah. I always say there is no secret formula to a great talk, but there is a secret ingredients. Right. And that is that all that all best speakers have in common. And again, we've touched on it before. I'm going to tell you again. That's how a good chef explains their recipe, right? Mm -hmm. say, There's no specific way yeah. of how to make the best biryani in the world, yeah. but this is what yeah. goes into it, right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but less is more, okay? Wow. And that means to deliver a message that makes an impact, you need to make sure that your speech uses the fewest words possible and that each word supports your overall theme. Stay with your message. You know, we said it earlier, don't stray from the message that you are del delivering. Don't unnecessarily waffle in your speech as that yep. only 
bores the listeners, Samajit. But it can also. Yeah, but this goes against conventional wisdom and conventional practice right now. I see. Yeah, exactly. It's a common trend yeah. right now. People are so scared of silence. Just fill in the silence with whatever comes to your mind. And it's, uh, I love that. Yeah. Less yeah. I mean, is even more. just a pause, you know, mm -hmm. when speakers are nervous, in that silence, instead of being silent, they stray. Mm. And you just think, mm. you know, when I started my when I started my speaking journey, I had an image on my mind of what a great public speaker was. To me, it was somebody using great body language when speaking in front of an audience, somebody using rhymes and rhetorical devices to bring the richness of a subject to life. And finally, somebody speaking with a powerful voice that awed the audience in submission, you know. There was a lot of good in this vision, Simaji, of yeah. where my public speaking journey could take me. And this vision inspired me to aim high and to constantly better myself. Nevertheless, the feedback I often received at the start of my journey was, Maz, less is more. You know, mm. in the realm of public speaking, too much of a good thing can end up having an effect that's opposite to the desired one. Less is more. The concept mm. means what you do is presented carefully, selected for the listeners. Presenting less information to your audience requires honing your material, making those discrete choices, and selecting only what is relevant and meaningful. And sometimes it's difficult to narrow things down because sometimes we have so much knowledge and we want to share it all. And we're struggle. excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're so excited. And you struggle to decide what to keep, what to cut, and this is why knowing your audience is so crucial. Put yourself into your listener's shoes. What information is most important to them? What mm -hmm. main message do you want to get across? And if you had one minute and one minute only to present your information, what key point would you stress? And that's the information to focus on, Simajit. Oh, I love that. I love that. If you had just one minute and just one minute to convey across your most important time, a point, what would it be? And then how do you plan the rest of your message around it? Right. I love that. I love that. And that the whole idea of less is more. And yeah. I will follow that advice. So I will just move on to the next question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Take a little pause in between. And we underestimate the power of pauses. Yeah. Uh, because at times, uh, probably we, we want to overcome the nervousness that we might be experiencing. Probably we've been conditioned, we've been taught that silence is dangerous. While silence is actually that can allow, maybe allow time the other person to comprehend and absorb what you're mm -hmm. saying. And we just okay. overlook it. Uh, mm -hmm. Maz, the next question is, uh, I'm sure a lot of our audience. So first of all, before we go any further, a, a huge round of applause for the massive, tremendous value that you're adding. I personally feel I'm attending a public speaking workshop once again, uh, <laughs> which uh, I haven't attended many of apart from the NLP and other things. So it, it, this has been a huge value add to me personally. I thank you for that. Um, we often keep getting these messages on LinkedIn and YouTube and um, other places. What are some of the daily rituals or practices? What should I have? Uh, I've got time now. People say, okay, it's in lockdown or work from home. I've got more time. I'd like to polish my public speaking skills. What recommendations would you have for students of public speaking out there? What can they do on a daily basis to overcome their fear and to um, develop better public speaking skills during this time? Okay, so my top tip is always breathing mm. because breathing exercises help you overcome the anxiety effectively, you know, mm -hmm. simply and quickly. They ease your tension. Breathing exercises actually release fear, they lower stress levels, and mm. they enhance your speaking voice. You know, the, the ability to harness your breath mm -hmm. is one of the most important areas of public speaking because. In order to speak, Simajit, we all need to breathe well. Indeed. And that's fully using our lungs. So mm -hmm. a simple exercise that I tell my clients to do is breathe deeply. Okay, and Should we do it right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And put one hand on your belly button, Simajit, and one hand on your chest. Okay. And breathe in deeply, noticing which hand moves. And I see a lot of people breathe while heaving their chest up and down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I want you to keep your chest steady. Okay. And think about breathing into your stomach. 
okay. as you're taking the breath. And then the ball slowly, like letting air out of a balloon. Right, right. Yeah. This is great uh, because I've suggested doing this belly breathing uh, previously, but this way, putting my hand on my belly, I could actually monitor, mm -hmm. am I breathing, is this shallow breathing on the lungs or is it belly, yeah. actual belly breathing? Which is great. Yeah. Let's do it one more and time. Then, Inhale. If you struggle with that, try wall sits. And so you lean against a wall with your back uh -huh. flat against the wall, your mm -hmm. legs slightly bent, mm -hmm. and this position helps you to focus on your abdomen while breathing instead of moving your chest. Mm -hmm. Then try speaking on the breath. And once you take in that full breath, you might not know what to do with it. Instead of holding it in, use that breath to support your words, letting it out steadily while mm -hmm. you're speaking. And I like to use a the analogy. Picture of a, a piece of um, um, shashmi, a thin slice of, you know, um, fish over a bed hungry. of rice. Hungry now, yeah. <laughs> it's lunchtime for <laughs> But a nice visual. Yeah, think of your voice as the fish and your breath as the bed of rice. In order to wow. support the voice, you need a constant full breath of air through the entire sentence. And what happens when the fish is longer than the rice? Ah. It falls over. And that's exactly Love that what I analogy. Doing. Love that analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when our breath trails off at the end of a sentence, creating a vocal fry. So when mm -hmm. you speak, practice mm -hmm. exhaling slowly while speaking mm -hmm. and letting your voice resonate with a full supported sound. First, practice exhaling while slowly counting one, two, three, four, five, and then practice exhaling on the words. Hello, my name is Maz. And, and it's so I'm much more deeper and more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. mm -hmm. um, so that's one exercise. You feel the more centered as well. I felt, felt more centered yeah. during this breathing exercise. You know? And on the Did contrary, you? I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel my thoughts were more clearer and I could get my attention back to exactly, you know, rather than on the next question or something else back to being in this moment, because this is one of the um, core components of meditation as well, Mas, uh, when the Buddhists and, uh, you know, all, in all meditation practices across the world, I think breathing is one very, very important component, whether it's in the Indian yoga tradition or elsewhere. In, in the Indian tradition, they call it the prana. The breathing is the prana, which means prana is your life. It's it's your life. Yeah. So it's it's, uh, uh, and I love this. Um, so this way I can monitor where the where where am I breathing? Is it chest breathing or is it belly breathing? And I also feel conversely when we are a little stressed or when the fight or flight response is activated, um, yeah. we somehow subconsciously stop breathing, and that's not very good for our voice or for our presentation. So thank you. No. You're about to move to the next one before I interrupted. Sorry, but <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, so breathing is very important. And the other one that I'd like to do with you, it's a um, six minute exercise, which is how to change your emotional state. Uh -huh. Wow. Can we do that? Yeah. I'd like you to close your eyes, Simajit, and focus on your breathing. Let any nerves or panic thoughts just drift by. And as you focus on your breath, Imagine you're breathing in a color you associate with confidence. Spend the next few seconds, Simajit, getting into a state of confidence and positivity. Let your body shape change as you feel more confident. Feel your shoulders coming back and you feel much more taller and in an upright position. Now, Glowing with confidence, imagine yourself stepping into the room or onto a stage that you are speaking from. Enjoy the sense of walking into the room that is filled with people. Stand in front of your audience, taking a moment to enjoy the sensation of being the center of attention. You notice, Sinajit, that you're not daunted by the prospect of speaking. You feel confident, you feel calm, and you feel supported by the audience. They can't wait to hear what you have to say, and you can't wait to say it. 
spend some time enjoying the moments before you start to speak. Now, as you start to speak, you find yourself whisked into the minds of the audience. You are watching yourself speaking. You're amazed at how confident, knowledgeable, and entertaining you are as a speaker. See how you interact with the audience, how you project your voice, and the way you carry yourself in front of the audience. Finally, as you start to wrap up what you have to say, you find yourself back in your own body. Your time speaking, Simajit, has gone better than you could have imagined. Look at all the smiling faces in the audience. And as you say your final words, your listeners thank you for what you had to say. Soak up this feeling. This is your power as a speaker. This exists inside you. Finally, take with you the feeling of calm and power that exists within your speaking room and put them inside a part of your body where your confidence lives. And this is usually your heart or your stomach. And know that all the confidence is there for you to access whenever you need it. And with that, Simajit, you can gently come back to your present state and open your eyes. That felt so good. <clears throat> I could all, uh, almost see a, a standing ovation there from the audience when you said visualize this. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm going to make a recording of this and listen to this more often. Um, and what I really loved about this um, visualization exercise, man, was the fact that um, I'm not act, I'm not there on a physical stage. I'm not there physically, but I am sort of scripting my own story of how it would be like when I'm on stage. So uh, that's a story I'd like to stick with and uh, wonderful, Fe felt really centered and balanced during that. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Could you please point out to, uh, I'm sure there's going to be loads of people on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook and Twitter, uh, where we are live streaming right now, um, who would be interested in reaching out to you or, or corporations and organizations and clubs who would want to know how their leaders and how their members can make a point. Uh, would you please share with us what's the best way to reach reach out to you and connect with you? Yeah. So I have a website, which is www.makeapoint.co.uk and also LinkedIn. Um, it's Maz if so. So yeah, either through the website or through the LinkedIn platform if you want to connect with me. Fantastic. Uh, we've been 52 minutes in this conversation. We'd originally thought 45, but before you let you, before we let you go, uh, one of the major challenges in the Indian subcontinent, that's India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, is the, the uh, mindset barrier for non-native English speakers, um, especially given the fact that uh, we raise the bar very high in terms of expectations from our young students of how they should be able to converse in a language which is actually not their own, which is a foreign language at the end of the day. So someone growing up in Pakistan would be learning Urdu or Punjabi or Farsi or uh, someone in India would be learning Hindi or Punjabi in other languages. And um, and then they, they have English, learning English at the same time. And then in a, another foreign language with all this additional pressure uh, of living in a globalized world, and especially when it comes to interacting with their international colleagues for whom English is the first language, who are native speakers. Folks in the Indian subcontinent, especially our youth, uh, I feel they, they sort of uh, move away or they're afraid of so many of these opportunities where they could speak up and find their voice and make a point and move forward and be heard and make a difference. And yet they somehow managed to stay away from the limelight due to all these inner negative conversations. Any words of advice for our young friends in the Indian subcontinent, Maz? Yeah, I think we touched on it earlier about being authentic. And it's not about trying to sound like somebody else because all mm. of these people, whether in Pakistan, India, wherever they are, they are so, so talented. Mm. And it's about giving your voice the richness and fullness it deserves every single time you speak so that the power of your voice matches the power of your words. If you wow. do that, people will listen. The power of your voice 
matching the power of your words. Love that. Love that. It's been a wonderful interaction here. I personally feel refreshed and energized in terms of um, the amount of learning I've had. Um, and I'm so very grateful to you for uh, sparing so much of your precious time for this interaction here. Um, I, I haven't been reading a lot, I'll be honest, during the lockdown, but um, I've been learning from um, subject matter experts like yourself. So once again, thank you, Maz. Before we let you go, any parting words of inspiration for our audience here today? Yeah, um, we've touched a lot today about being yourself, being authentic, there's so much noise. And I want to talk about the, well, leave our parting words on the illusion of perfection. You know, mm. we're all noticing in the physical world around us. And there's a relentless drive in social media to create an illusion of perfection in all our lives. That Indeed. life has to be perfect. Everybody has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And we all know, Simajit, that this is not reality. It True. is up to all of us to be truthful with ourselves and the world, because why? It is through the cracks that the light gets in. Wow. And sharing our whole selves with both our perfections and imperfections is really okay. And we must recognize that this is not the imperfections we have. It is how we need to personally actually develop in ourselves, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. us and the wider world to be a kinder, happier, and more tolerant place. We to feel comfortable that yeah. imperfection is part of perfection being and sharing our whole selves and this is more than okay for everything in this journey on life we're on how am i going to put this there is a right wing mm -hmm. and there's a left wing mm -hmm. for the wing of love there is anger for the wing of destiny there is fear right. for the wing of pain there is healing for the wing of hurt there is forgiveness. For the wing of pride, uh, there is humility. For the wing of giving, there is taking. Right. For the wing of fears, there is joy. For the wing of rejection, there is acceptance. Mm -hmm. For the wing of judgment, there is grace. For the wing of honor, there is shame. For the wing of letting go, there is a wing of keeping. And we can only fly, Simajit, with two wings. And two wings can only stay in the air if there is balance. Two right. beautiful wings is perfection. There is a generation of people who mm -hmm. idolize perfection as the existence of only one of these wings every time. Mm -hmm. But I see that a bird with one wing is imperfect. Right. An angel with one wing is imperfect. So this generation of people strive to always cut off the other wing in the mm -hmm. hope of modeling the ideal of perfection. And in right. doing so, we create a crippled race. And I want to part today on one of the basic rules of the universe. Mm -hmm. And that is nothing is perfect, Simajir. Yeah, absolutely. Even if we spend all our time and effort in making, making sure it appears perfect on mm -hmm. social media or Instagram, and in that race to get more likes and more approval of from other people, at, at the core, we know nothing is perfect and we should make peace with that imperfection. I think uh, that was a beautiful message there, Maz. Thank you so much. Make peace you. with your imperfection. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Maz himself for you, Maz. Once again, thank you. And I'm sure we will host you once again for follow-up questions that I'm sure the audience will have uh, at this point of time. You look after yourself. Khuda Hafiz. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye.